The events of the 1st century BC shook the Roman Republic to its foundations and led to the formation of the Empire. Many of these events, such as Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, are well known, but there are ones that are overlooked. For almost a decade, a bitter guerrilla war was fought in the province of Hispania, where a rebellious Roman governor battled for survival against the full might of Rome. Welcome to our video on Sertorius and the Sertorian War. Shoutouts to Imperator Rome and Paradox Interactive for sponsoring this video. The latest 1.3 update is now live, and it brings many new features and major changes to the game. There is now greater attention given to the characters, as the experience system makes them more important, while fewer major families to track means that each of them are more crucial. The national mission trees are reworked to help guide your actions. The free Punic Wars content pack fleshes out the Roman and Carthaginian factions even more. Ten unique Roman missions will be essential in the conquest of Italy. The free pack also adds the Numidian army model, Carthaginian ship model, and three new music tracks. For a week between the 3rd and 8th of December, this excellent game with endless replayability will be free to play on Steam. Support our channel and play Imperator Rome for free by clicking the link in the description. Born in Sabinium in 123 to a family of minor nobles, Quintus Sertorius was raised by his widowed mother, Rhea, whom Plutarch describes him as being excessively fond of. After a typical Roman education in rhetoric, martial skills, horse riding, and the Greek epics, Sertorius, far too ambitious to remain a provincial aristocrat, travelled to Rome and entered public life. His unique style of rhetoric elicited a comment from the great orator Cicero, who called Sertorius the roughest and readiest of all the illiterate ranters he'd ever heard. Probably, not seeing himself as an orator prompted the inexperienced Sertorius to embark on the most respected Roman career path in the legions, which were at the moment facing the Cimbri threat. Serving under Quintus Servilius Capio, Sertorius was one of the few survivors of the disastrous Battle of Arausio. Sertorius pledged his service to Marius, a decision which charted the course of his life. He volunteered to serve as a spy, dressing as a Cimbri warrior, learning their tongue and joining their attack on Hispania, a place with which he was to become intimately familiar. Sertorius slipped back to Marius when the Cimbri returned to Italy in 102 BC and was rewarded for his valiant efforts. He probably fought with the legions at Aquisexte and Vercule, seeing the end of the Cimbri threat. He continued his service with the legions in Hispania, and then was a quaestor, the financial supervisor in Cisalpine Gaul. In 91 BC, the social war between the Romans and their Italic allies broke out. At first, Sertorius used his position to supply men and materiel from his province, but then marched south to fight in person. The early 30s rising star lost an eye in the vicious fighting, and when the war was won in 88 BC, emerged as a hero in Rome. However, the rivalry between Marius and Sulla stymied the Marian allied Sertorius's bid for election to the Tribunate. In the sullen civil wars that followed, we witness Sertorius's loyalty, straightforwardness, and mercilessness. He repeatedly questioned his commander's methods, such as the employment of a slave army in retaking Rome. One night when this force was encamped in a theatre, Sertorius had his regular legionaries surround the camp and slay them using javelins. The new Marian leadership and Sertorius despised each other, so in 83 BC, Sertorius set out for Hispania to establish a Marian power base there. The province's fragmented geography was its strength. Hispania was dominated by a huge central plateau surrounded by mountains. Serving as strategic gateways to this otherwise almost impenetrable Iberian interior are five river valleys on the Atlantic coast and three on the Mediterranean, and this facilitated a divided political situation. When Sertorius arrived, around 40 tribes jostled for position and warred with one another, hemming the Roman-dominated regions to the Mediterranean seaboard. These tribes comprised three main groups. 
Iberians inhabiting the eastern coastal region, Aquitani living in the distant northwest, and a large assortment of mixed Celt-Iberian invaders occupying the central plateau. The Roman territory was divided between Hispania Cateria, nearer Spain, and Hispania Ulteria, further Spain. Sertorius was appointed the propraetor of these provinces by Marius. He needed to deal with untamed mountain tribes who still held sway in the Pyrenees, and aiming to save time, Sertorius bribed them, telling his outraged companions that, if a man has a lot to do, nothing is more precious than time. After getting through the treacherous mountains, he set to solidifying his power base with help from the warlike locals. Sertorius addressed the rampant excesses of previous Roman administrations of Hispania, lowered taxes, and befriended or gradually endeared himself to the locals. Meanwhile, the civil war raged on in Italy. Refugees trickled into Sertorius's court, informing him that Sulla had won and then marched into Rome, brutally purging his enemies. Sertorius, of course, was on the proscription lists, and after Gnaeus Pompey subdued a Marian remnant in Africa, he stood alone in Hispania against the Sullen regime. He prepared for the coming storm. In 81 BC, Sulla sent an army towards Iberia by land. Knowing that winter blocked any other route of approach, Sertorius sent a legion under Julius Salinator to fortify the Pyrenees mountain passes. It was a shrewd defensive move, and it made direct assault impossible, but Salinator was eventually betrayed by a subordinate and killed, allowing Sulla's army to penetrate deep into Hispania. Facing overwhelming odds and almost certain defeat, Sertorius and his 3,000 remaining troops fled to Mauritania early in the spring of 80 BC. The Moorish tribes didn't allow the renegades to move in, and Sertorius, advised by Sicilian pirates, attacked the Balearic Islands, where he was defeated in a naval battle by one of Sulla's Spanish governors. After a painstaking limp west to recover at the mouth of the Betis River, Sertorius finally set himself up in Mauritania properly, dislodging a hostile local king, easily absorbing a sullen army sent to deal with him, and ruling autonomously for a few months. The local population believed that the giant corpse of Antaeus, son of Poseidon and Gaia, was buried at a certain place in this small kingdom. One day he went to see for himself, and had the tomb excavated, and after supposedly witnessing the demigod's corpse, performed sacrifices and promoted the local traditions regarding the tomb. It shows just how good Sertorius was and would be when it came to integrating himself with his foreign subject peoples. His African kingdom was defensible and prosperous, but events across the straits would pull Sertorius in. Sulla's new governor, Perfidius, was oppressing the locals and invading their territory. The Lusitanians weren't going to take it, and invited Sertorius to lead their forces. After landing near Gibraltar in 80 BC and meeting up with his new allies, he marched against Perfidius. Sertorius was cunning and managed to lure Perfidius into a swampy estuary before slaughtering his army. The Sullans lost 2,000 men and the entirety of Hispania. Sertorius then dispatched generals to mop up the remaining Sullans in the north, and began planning. It was a big job. He had to remain a firmly Roman governor, rather than an Iberian chieftain, if clemency was ever going to be possible. But he also required the extensive assistance of local tribes in order to defend himself before it could be counted on. During this time, we begin to get a glimpse of Sertorius's complex character through the surviving sources. He seems to have been an industrious, charismatic leader, never fearful or excessively indulgent, notably eschewing drunkenness. According to Plutarch, he convinced many that he was a mild soul, best suited to quiet life, whose enemies had driven him to take up arms in his own defence and practically forced him against his will to become a soldier. His tendency to give generous gifts, practice gentle governance, and his reciprocity made Sertorius incredibly popular among the local tribes, while his tendency to share their burdens engendered intense loyalty with the troops. During the early part of his dominion over Hispania, a seemingly mundane event shows us how expertly Sertorius made use of anything to ingratiate himself with the Iberian tribes. 
a lowly hunter known as Spanus managed to capture an unusual white fawn out in the wilderness. Knowing that Sartorius had a habit of graciously accepting and then repaying such gifts, he took it to him. Soon the creature became quite tame, not minding the chaos of army camp life or the bustling city crowds. Seeing an opportunity, Sartorius proclaimed that the fawn had been sent down to him by the goddess Diana, and routinely revealed hidden information to him. When he received covert intelligence that an enemy was marching against him, for example, he would inform the tribes that it was instead Diana who had given him the information. Sartorius's people began to believe they were being guided by godly power rather than the will of mortal foreigners, and that made them all the more willing to go along with what their governor was doing. Rebellious Hispania would need all the help it could get, as Sulla's replacement governor was on his way with an army. This was Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius, consul for 80 BC, who hated the Marians. Sertorius began drilling his troops over winter. The tribes, especially the Lusitanians, were keen to face the legions, but their commander realized that trying to make his troops into inferior copies of the Romans would just lead to defeat. So he adapted, making use of their natural strengths. When Sertorius's words didn't convince his allies, he resorted to an object lesson to convince them. He had two horses brought before the tribal council, one a large powerful steed and the other a smaller weaker pony. Then he asked an elderly man to pluck out the hairs of the strong mount's tail one hair at a time, and a young strong man to rip out the tail by force. The weaker older man accomplished his task of retrieving the hairs, while the younger man only succeeded in exhausting himself. Sertorius then explained that the Roman army was much like the tail of a horse. Confront the legions all at once, and victory would be impossible. But pick them apart piecemeal, and they can be overcome. This argument convinced the tribes, and they quickly began to train, learning Roman-style formations, signals, and tactics, transforming individuals into a true army. When Metellus finally entered Hispania in 79 BC, the Sertorian commanders were ready for him. Metellus's army began to suffer devastating harassment, making foraging and scouting lethal. Proving himself a genius in guerrilla warfare and a peerless leader of men, at one point the middle-aged Sertorius challenged his opponent to single combat. Metellus declined, and forever after Sertorius would derisively call him the old woman. This irregular warfare finally ground the Roman campaign to a halt, when, a year after it began, news came from Rome that Sulla had passed away. With his iron-fisted unity gone, Metellus chose to take a passive approach. Sertorius wasn't as idle, and used the free hand to subdue more Iberian tribes in the interior who hadn't submitted yet. The gains increased the amount of Spanish silver that flowed into his treasury, and allowed him to prepare for the resumption of war. Resume it did in 76 BC, in the form of future triumvir Gnaeus Pompey, who chased a rebellious Roman commander called Perpenna into Hispania. The latter had been forced to join up with Sertorius by his anxious soldiers. The confident and careless Pompey threw his veteran legions onto the Iberian Peninsula, but he too was quickly outmatched by the lightly armoured and mobile Sertorian troops. Within just a year, two entire legions of Pompey's army had been shredded by Sertorius and his brilliant generalship. However, we don't just get an impression of Sertorius's military genius, but also his sense of honour and justice. When they captured Lauron in 76 BC, a notoriously savage cohort of Perpenna's newly arrived Roman legions began committing rapes in a conquered city. Sertorius, unwilling to tolerate this horrific conduct by his own troops, had the entire unit executed. They served as an example. No further such incidents are known to have occurred. A climactic battle occurred in 75 BC at the Sucro River, when Sertorius saw an opportunity to eliminate Pompey before Metellus could intervene. He sent Perpenna back to delay Metellus and then engaged with Pompey. About evenly matched in numbers, each general lined up on their own right wing and charged at the opposing flank. Pompey fought a duel against a giant Iberian infantryman, 
and his wing began to push the Sertorians back. Sertorius learned about this threat and reacted swiftly, riding over to his left, rallying those whose morale was faltering and pushing forward those who remained stalwart. The Pompeian right collapsed and routed, a turn of events which seems to have taken Pompey himself by surprise. He escaped only at the very last moment by dismounting from his ornately clad steed. After tidying up the other wing, the battle ended and night fell. Pompey was in a terrible position and almost certainly would have been destroyed the next morning. However, Metellus arrived at dawn, having bested Perpenna and saved Pompey from utter disaster in the nick of time. Sertorius knew that he had lost a great chance to end one of his rivals and stated scornfully, if the old woman had not made an appearance, I'd have thrashed the boy and packed him off to Rome. The great Sertorian leader was embarrassing both Metellus and Pompey, but he couldn't be everywhere at once. So gradually, the war began to turn, and Rome's seemingly infinite resources began to have their effect. In addition to warfare, Romanization of the wild and unconquered barbarians was also on Sertorius's agenda. His methods of integrating and transitioning the population would, as Dr. Philip Metajek points out, become standard procedure in the later Republican and Imperial eras. Sertorius was a true pioneer who impacted centuries of world history. He introduced Roman equipment to the Iberian tribal leadership by liberally distributing gifts of legionary-style helmets, gladii, tunics, and cloaks for service and loyalty. As they embraced these replacements with enthusiasm, so did their people. To promote a sense of Iberian unity, Sertorius moved his capital to Osca. Iberian warrior leaders made up his retinue and were thus Romanized, and Sertorius did the same for their children by setting up an academy in Osca, much like the one Philip II of Macedon established in Pella for the offspring of his nobility. A fine Greek and Roman education was given here, and Sertorius promised that it would lead to administrative positions and power for the educated scions in time. These children were also de facto hostages to ensure that the chieftains continued being loyal to Sertorius. In the meantime, he also looked after the Romans who had come to him as refugees, forming a senate and appointing caestas and praetors from among them. It was quickly becoming a Rome outside of Rome, and it was clear that despite his alienation from his mother country, Sertorius was a fervent advocate of Roman values. Despite his military genius and overtures to Mithridates in the east, Roman reinforcements kept coming, his enemies got better, and his allies proved not equal to the task at hand. Perpenna blundered into several defeats and lost almost all of his own legionaries. As Sertorian fortunes gradually worsened and his territory was rolled back, Metellus offered a generous reward of 100 talents and amnesty to any traitor who killed his enemy. The Romans with Sertorius began to scheme and plot, Perpenna foremost among them. Hearing about this through his phenomenal intelligence network, Sertorius, according to Livy, changed into a savage and dissolute man, succumbing to vice and brutality, and abandoning himself to wine, women, and song. Many of the children at his academy were enslaved or executed as punishment for their tribe's crimes. Increasing numbers of them were slowly making deals with Metellus. Naturally, this led more people to conspire as well. Perpenna, attending one of the many austere banquets hosted by his nominal master, assassinated Sertorius with a hidden sword along with a group of conspirators in 72 BC. The Sertorian War largely ended with the death of Sertorius himself, and the victorious Pompey captured and executed Perpenna. The tribes went back to being a nuisance for Rome, but Sertorius played a large role in bringing Hispania into the Roman fold, and the provinces would remain crucial for the Roman economy for the next five centuries. We always have more stories to tell, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.